Yo, this is Miguel Campbell. You're here at the studio in my house in Leeds, um, and I'm about to walk you through a track that I started with my friend Bexlot, um, Project Free Falling. 20 steps away from the highest feeling I'm free falling I've got nothing left to lose And I can break When my mind leaps Get ready I'm free falling I've got nothing left to lose um. So today I'm going to show you through um, the bones of a project that I started working on. Um, I'm trying to put across something in the essence of something special because I feel that um, I'll be able to demonstrate to you how to get that classic sound that I always um, that I always come with, you know. When I'm first deciding on starting a track, I usually tend to look at a beat and I'll select a beat. Um, because I've made so many tracks in the past, I tend to think of different songs that I've made and um, I'll get the basis of a beat from one of the tracks I make. Um, this particular track here, um, I used a couple of samples from sample CDs and from records and things that I've had in the past. Um, I had a beat sent to me by one of my artists, Minota, um, a guy from Paris, and I used that as the back bedding for the beat. Um, and I also use some of the um, some of the machine here. So okay, so here if I just drop out the um, the additions here, you can hear we've got a nice a nice back beat going just on a four four. So if we drop the the snare and the hi hats, just makes it a little bit tighter, a little bit clickier, and then the full kick drops and gives you the humph that you need. Um, so generally I'd sit and I would play around and get a beat sounding um, how I'd like it and then once I have that I'd generally focus on the musical elements to the track. So for this particular track it was, um, I thought that I'd show you something along the lines of something special to give you that typical sound that I often come up with. Um, and really what I, um, what I started with following the beat was to come with the bass line um, and once I drop the bass line um, it kind of instantly brings that feel so let's have a listen. Okay, yeah. So that's a bass where I've used um, I've used the Scarby bass actually, um, the J bass from the Native Instruments Complete section. Um, gives you a nice realistic tone. Um, sounds really cool. On the upper ends, you have all of the different string noises, so you can make really realistic sounding bass lines. Really nice, you know. I think for for some of the bass lines in the tracks of mine and my partner Matt Hughes in Mam and things, um, we tend to use a mixture between synthetic basses and um, and realistic basses. But um, a lot of the time, if you have a realistic bass tone, it kind of takes away the noisy elements that you need. Um, one of the things that we used to always do um, was just use a low pass filter on really big fat synthy sounds and kind of as you adjust the resonance you can really come up with that daft punky type tone you know um, but yeah for this particular track i decided to use um use a bass it's got a nice fred falk sound to it you know um i was really inspired by the fred falk video that we watched on future music so word up there um, and yeah, I think um, once I once I got the bass line down here, it was then important to try and find the key structure um, and the key progression. Just on that, I'm not really a skilled keyboard player. I can play keyboard. Um, however, since purchasing this new machine thing, um, I found a new function within machine whereby you can set the pads to play different chords for you and you assign the pads and the chords and things. Um, makes things really easy. Um, and if you do that, then it's really just a case of I find the root note of the song, um, set the scale, and then it kind of does it for you. So it's a really interesting thing um, that's really been helping me with my music over the last month or two since I got this thing. Well, you know, I did um, I did have a few piano lessons, and I learned the difference between my major and my minor, learned how to play chords and things. However, 
um, because of the way that this machine calculates it, I come up with chord progressions that I would never otherwise play, um, or it would take me another five to ten years to learn how to play those particular chords, you know. Um, it can also take care of both hands for you, so that's a really good thing also. For the chords in this track, I decided to use an electric piano patch from the Mini Nova. Um, I just added with it um, a little bit of tremolo and a little bit of the modulation to give it like a, some sort of movement, uh, make it a little bit more dynamic. Um, for the actual chords that I added to this track, I used the MIDI out function of machine um, because once you assign the um, the chord function that machine has so that you can control each chord by just one of the pads. Um, you can take the MIDI out of machine and direct it pretty much anywhere um, and use the MIDI information. Um, and yeah, I just sent it to the Mini Nova um, and I came up with something that sounded like this. So it's like really easy, you press a few buttons, the chords are rolling. Um, and then yeah, when you add it to the rest of the music, it Sounds great. As you can see, I try to keep things really clean and simple within my music, you know, I don't go overboard with the amount of tracks and things. I have a few tracks in respect of my drums. Um, we have the bass and we have the roads there. When I was um, when I first started out producing, I used to I used to make music in a similar way, and it just didn't sound right, and I always had problems. I used to add lots and lots of different sounds, trying to make it sound better, um, really compensating for how thin the music sounded, you know. Um, but I tend to find that a lot of it is um, it's all down to the sound selection and choosing the right sound for the right scenario. Um, in this particular instance, because we have a vinyl sounding loop running through the beat. Um, we have the bass line down, we have the roads running through a compressor and then the side chain on the compressor kind of tightens everything up. Um, for this I assigned everything just to one bus in Cubase um, and I named that bus the side chain compressor bus um, and within there I use the standard side chain compressor that's built into Cubase. Um, I route it from a silent kick drum that runs throughout the track at the top here. Um, and a really interesting feature with this particular sidechain compressor is the hold feature. Um, how fast the attack and the release works, um, the controls are there, but then the additional control of a hold really makes it interesting for me because it will dictate how long the sidechain kind of bites for. I'll just run you through a quick example so you can hear it. So that's with a very little attack time um, and a little hold time. And as we increase this, you'll hear the compressor starts to work more and more. Um, I tend to find that 75, 50, that's like the perfect area for it to sit in. It will just bounce back nice and tight. Um, I read a long time ago and I kind of felt it a long time ago also that the best thing to try and do is when using a sidechain compressor is have the release time released totally in time to when the next beat is about to begin so that you have a gradual pump and yeah kind of um, you get maximum effect and just generally if I lose some sort of volume from the compressor I just use some of the makeup gain add it it brings the volume back up makes everything sound nice and, um, and lively. When Bex came to record the vocals on this particular track, um, I think I'd sent to her maybe four or six ideas and um, we recorded vocals on all of them, you know. She just thinks of certain things, comes here, I help her write some of the words to the lyrics and just um, make them kind of cohesive with the feel of the music and then, um, yeah, that's something that we did here. Catch me, I'm leaning Okay, so really cool diva sounding um, vocal there. Um, very typical of how we usually work together. Um, for the processing of the vocals, um, 
similar with something special and not that kind of girl. I tend to go for a real dry and upfront sound, you know. Um, even when remixing, people send me the stems for the vocals um, and they have the reverbs and the different effects on the stems. Um, I tend to get rid of them and I use the dry vocal, throw it in there and I use just a very small amount of reverb. Um, for this particular track here, um, I use some of the Waves plugins, the Waves gate and compressor, just to um, take away the silence in between, um, in between the vocal lines. Um, I also used another interesting um, processor, the Butch Vig Vocals by um, Waves, which um, I watched a video tutorial and I had to listen to the, um, the pros and cons of what the plugin was doing because, of course, with all of the different elements on here, the de the saturator, we have all of these plugins probably many times over in different places. And what I didn't want to do was simply have another plugin that would um, that would do the same things, you know. Um, so when I checked out this particular plugin, I, w I was actually amazed at the sound of it because it really brings out the dynamics of the vocals. Um, and then I basically pumped all of that through just one of the um, Native Instruments reverbs, the RC24, um, just to give it a little bit of a um, less dry feel, but it's still really upfront and um, I'll just say karaoke sounding. Um, so yeah. Okay, so now I'll let you hear the um, the vocal line and I'll turn the plugins on and off as we move through um, so you can hear the difference and how it's been processed and you'll hear that there's um, only very subtle differences to, to what you're going to hear but the differences are there enough to help it by through the mix. Catch me, I'm leaning. Okay, so if I use the gate to cut off all of the stuff in the Accommodate middle. Accommodate me and the flight I'm leading. Okay, now I'll turn on the Butch Vig vocals. Feel the air around me move, it's the rush of You can hear that jump out straight away, you know. Um, sounds really cool. And I'll turn it off now. 20 steps away from the highest okay. sphere. So it's only a really subtle difference, but then you can I'm kind of hear just um, the EQs, the saturator, the de they're all turned on ever so slightly, but it really brings out um, a pop music feel to it. Um, I actually started work from one of the presets here, one of the Butch Vig um, lead vocals too, um, and I just tweaked that slightly. Um, back in the day when I used to use my PC for my music, I tend to find that the presets weren't as good as what you could, um, what you could come up with yourself, but these days I'm playing around with the presets more and more, certainly in dynamic plugins, and I'm really impressed with the results of some of them. Um, and I think the best thing to do is just try them out and then tinker with the knobs on the ones you like, you know? And then I'll just um, turn the butch fig back on here and I'll let you hear it with the, vo with the reverb and without the reverb, just so you can hear the small, um, the small amounts I'm using. I've got nothing left to lose And I can break When my mind leaps Get ready I Okay, so if we hear that in the mix now. Okay, so it still sounds really up front, you know, even with the yeah, reverb there, seeing it back. Move, it's the rush I've been. 20 steps away from the highest feeling. Um, another really cool feature that I've um, been using lots recently, certainly when working with vocalists, um, with this particular version of Cubase, you have the Varios Audio, which allows you to um, to analyse the pitch and um, and mess around with the um, the different temperaments and things. Um, if we take a look at this one here, you can see that I've analysed the pitch of Bex's vocal, and you can see that it spreads it across the. Um, the keynotes for you so I can actually see the notes that she's hitting. Um, if there are any that I think need tidying up or fixing in any way I can just go in there grab it straight away and it's done. Um, another really cool thing is we can um, we can go in and extract the MIDI um, for the vocal part and then we can use that and manipulate different leads and things. Um, really good for pop music records if you have a vocal and a chorus and then you follow that with a lead even if it's just a xylophone or something. Um, really gives you that something to whistle and something to hum later on you know. Um, and yeah that's something that um, this Varios audio feature is really helpful for extracting the MIDI data not just from vocals, it works with guitars and other things as well. Um, helps you fit everything in your mix basically without it sounding wrong. 
Yeah, you can dive in, you can find out what key it's in. If um, Sometimes if I'm working with samples or if I'm working with a guitar sample or something, I'll add this to a vocal and everything will sound perfect apart from one note at the end or in the middle or something. Um, when I used to use Acid Pro, it was just a case of zoom in, cut that part and maybe try and transpose it, you know. Um, but now with the Varios Audio thing, we can literally just go in and manipulate the audio straight off. Um, very similar to how Melodyne used to work. Um, but yeah, for me, it works a hundred times nicer than that, you know. As you can see from the screen here, I always start with the beat and then the bass will start and then I'll slowly introduce the elements and a real straightforward, um, a real straightforward thing. Um, I've always liked to keep things classic sounding because I kind of feel that rather than doing something gimmicky that sounds good today, I like my music to sound good next year and the year after also. I mean, when we, when we record the vocals, we kind of just sing what's on the notepad, you know, um, just sing everything in there. Um, Bex is really good at just getting it down in one take, you know. Um, if she doesn't nail it on the first take, then she may ask to come back another time and nail it again. But um, She's such a good vocalist for me, I'm happy with everything that she does. And generally with the arrangements of it, um, I will often hear just one line of something that she sings and thinks, right, that's, um, that's the hook for the track. Um, in saying that, I did something similar with this basic arrangement here. If we, um, if we listen to the chorus part of, um, of this track, or what I'd say was the chorus, um, there's just a very cool little part at the end that I decided to use to loop over and close out the particular audio scene. I've got nothing left to lose And I can break When my mind keeps getting ready I'm free for Okay, so that particular delay tail there, um, for me, I could leave that running all the way through the song, you know, and it just sounds like I did percussive parts or um, another additional instrument. When I look at the basic arrangements of my tracks, um, it's something where I've always found it reasonably easy to get a basic arrangement down. Um, if I ever struggle, I, I once read something in Computer Music magazine, actually, um, and it was to draw a picture of what you for see the um, the arrangement will look like. Um, the way I just explained that I start with the drums and the different elements and bring them in one by one, it's quite easy to draw these blocks on a piece of paper and then without even listening to the song, you can go about arranging it so that it looks that way. Um, when I first started producing, I used to make 15 minute tracks because my screen was zoomed out that much, you know? Um, but yeah, it's once you, um, once you have down a basic arrangement, it's much easier to then go about actually finishing your song and thinking, right, where does that work and where doesn't it work? Um, I think one of the worst things you can do is sit there with just a four bar loop on the screen going over and over again because I've done it many times myself and if it sounds wicked, you'll sit there for 12 hours and it'll never go anywhere. You'll just start the beats, turn off the beats and um, yeah, I think it's, um, it's really important to at least think about the structure and I mean, even if you was to use the same layout that you've used in a previous song or something that you've um, something that you've come up with a friend or anything like that just um, just think of the original concept of it and then from there you can kind of flesh it out listen to it in the car and see what needs to be done what I would probably do in this particular instance um, thinking about the way that I have this preliminary arrangement I would really start thinking about the different transitions and maybe looking at a few drum fills um, and things of that nature just to try and smooth off the edges and um, yeah, let's take a look at it. Okay, so um, what I'd probably do to try and um, program some fills is I'd go about adding a drum kit to machine and then just bang on some buttons and um, see what happens. Yeah, so as I, as I look through here, I have um, the Native Instruments Complete collection on here um, and I have the, um, the 80s drummer kit um, and we also have the black heavy metal kit. Um, so I'll load this one first. Okay, perfect.
Okay, so if we take a look at the machine, we can, um, we can just tighten these up real easy. Quantize. And nudge this one back to the left. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, the way machine runs, it's, um, it's a bit more complicated with regards to the arrangements. I believe it's different to the first machine. So I kind of, um, I kind of think to myself whereabouts what I want the fills to run in the track. And I then make a decision on the arrangement and whether I want to straight in put the sounds in the arrangement or whether I want to, um, to record them on the fly. Um, to be honest, with this particular track and with these drum fills, what I would probably do is arrange them on the fly, meaning rather than creating any small patterns, I will probably just create a pattern the whole length of the song, and then I'll go about recording the bits in that way. Um, so if we take a look at the pattern length just here on the right, um, and I'll check the pattern length of the song here, which is 192 bars in length. So I'll just set this to exactly the same length here. 192. And then what that's going to do is give me free reign over whereabouts I can add the drum fill. Slightly unorthodox, but at the same time, it, um, it gives me more freedom with regards to where I hit the pads and where I want them. Um, and then it saves me having to mess about arranging the scenes and things afterwards also. I just treat machine like it's um, like it's a MIDI track in itself, um, and I don't necessarily have to do that using the machine software. I can do that using um, a MIDI track within Cubase, also just um, just rooted to machine. You can do it whichever way, um, but because this is new to me, I kind of I think it's fun and I like using it this way. You know, just get away from the keyboard and that side of things. Um, okay, so I'll go through this. Now. that one, I'll just come back and listen to it again. Okay, so that's good for me. Um, and then I tend to just um, go through the different parts of the song and work out if I want a drum fill there or if I wanted some sort of transition. Um, so I'm just going to listen to how this one pads out now. as we go along hit by hit. Okay, so for me, I think I'm happy with, um, with those few hits there. We just need to probably turn the volumes down slightly. So if we go into the group setting, and I'll just turn the volume We need some sort of um, some sort of swoosh or effect here, so I'll go in here and um, I'm sure I have something that's um, yeah. We don't want anything with too much of a tone. We just want something. Um Something more like that, and then I mean we can cut the end off it if it doesn't sound right or anything. We just need a little something to lead into where the um, where the vocal track begins. So I'll drag this into here. We'll just put this in place. Okay, so that's quite cool. It's a little bit overboard. So um, what we'll do now, we'll just have to turn it down and um, try and sort out the tone of it. Um, generally, what I would do in order to do that is you can see this big part where it starts to go crazy a little bit. I'll simply chop this out. So if we turn off the quantize, 
I'll just jump in and cut it pretty much anywhere um, and get rid of the end. And we just kind of get it quite close there. And generally what I would do is duplicate it um, and then we can go about reversing the other side. Um, so if we come here, process this, select the process and reverse. We'll make a new version so it doesn't affect the old one. Um, and then we'll do the same and just trim this down. Probably to around here. Okay, that's cool, but the tail kind of goes on a little bit too long for me, so we'll just kill that off. And we'll adjust some of the volume on the end. Catch me, I'm leaning. Okay, so that's a nice, easy, quick transition into the vocal. And yeah, you just got to watch the volume so that they don't pop out too much. Um, And then again, if I look at where I may want this particular, um, how do you say, uprise, um, I can tell you now that I'd want it somewhere near the breakdown when the music drops out. Um, and again, thinking of our basic arrangement and things, um, without even applying this, we can, we can pretty much know where we need things to happen because um, I suppose the thing is I know my way of working and this is why it's important that each individual learns their way of working in what they're trying to achieve and for me I'm trying to achieve A, B, C and D and so I do these things every time and um, I think it's important to know what it is you're trying to achieve before you set out about doing it, you know, um, and I mean that's probably the hardest part about the whole thing, isn't it? Okay, so I'm going to take this now and I'm just going to duplicate that and I'm going to put it right here where the, um, where the next breakdown occurs. Okay, so if we listen to it in context there, just before that. Okay, and I'm actually going to drag out the, um, the end of that one. So I think once I've, um, once I've looked at the different transitional parts of the track and um, put in a couple of tom fills and things just to help the track move along, um, I would probably say that from here we need some sort of lead line or some sort of a PGation or something um, just to musically help it through the sections where there is um, no vocal and we just have the beats and the keys rolling. Um, it'd just be nice to have a little something added in there. Um, not too sure what, but let's take a look. Okay, so here I have a MIDI track which is um, set up to the Roland XV5050. Um, it's probably my favourite sound module that I've ever that I've ever owned. Um, for a, for a short while, I stopped using it because um, there was a really amazing plugin on the PC um, by Luxonics called Ravity, um, and I used to use the Ravity plugin, um, and it kind of rendered this out of play for quite a long time but then um, since upgrading my system I've been using this again I'm really happy with the sound of it so um, yeah let's go for it. Take a look at what we have in here.
Okay, so here I've come across to the um, to the guitar patches, right, which are quite cool. So we'll just have a little play and see if we can come up with a small riff or something that'll help um, help it along in the bass section. <laughs> Okay, that sounds pretty cool. Um, right. Okay, so we'll come in here and see if I can um, record a part of that down. That sounds okay. Okay, so if we go with something along those lines, um, we'll just open it up, see what we have. Okay, yeah, so we should just be able to quantize that. Of course, the beauty with MIDI is we can just then flick through the different sounds and see how it sounds, you know. And typically, um, I mean, sometimes I have a certain sound in mind, but right now I don't have a sound in mind, so I'll just get the pattern on the way and then I'll have a listen through and see if I can find something that actually suits what's happening in the song. Um, so let's take a look. Okay, so yeah, I quite like that as well. Um, just a little bit of pitch bend on one or two of the notes as it runs through, so I think we should overdub that and record some of the pitch bend in there, definitely. Okay, let's have a look.
Okay, so the way that this is set up then, you can see it's recorded another MIDI part over the top of our original MIDI part, but this time we have in here the, um, the necessary modulation that we require for the, um, for the pitch bend. And then we can just go in here and we can, um, we can tidy everything up accordingly and get it sounding exactly as we want it to sound. Yeah, once I've found the pitch bend that, um, that I'm happy with, I'll just put it wherever I want and I'll copy and paste it and move it accordingly. Um, but yeah, we're just doing this really quick and on the fly, so I'm just going to find one that I like and then I'll probably delete the rest of them and that will leave us with a nice, um, a nice feel on the lead. Okay, so I'm actually happy with the first two in this instance. Um, so what I'm going to do is go back in here and I'll get rid of the last two pitch events. So, I mean, now that I've, um, now that I've recorded in um, the pitch modulation, um, again, we can, we can go about using this particular, how do you say, language information to any particular piece of hardware that we want, you know? Um, so, I mean, what I'd probably do is still have a look through some of the other, um, some of the other patches that we can find, some of the musical elements, and, um, and come up with something that sounds as, as I like, you know? Um, but for this particular um, for this particular piece of the project, I'm going to go with this. Incidentally, listening to um, to that particular part that I'm using, it's um, it's definitely the patch that I used in um, in the Talking Box song um, that me and Matt Hughes did um, on Wolf and Lamb Black back in the day. So yeah, there you go. People often ask me how I how I manage to achieve the sound that I achieve and what I use for mastering and things. Um, and the truth of the matter is you need to try and get it sounding as close to the master as possible before you get to the master stage. The last thing you want to do is start adding lots of plugins to the red fader um, to try and make it sound better because it should all sound better before it gets to that part, you know. Um, but on that note, there are one or two things that I use and I, there is a secret weapon that I always use on my, um, on my master bus um, and that's the Sonic Maximizer by BBE. Um, with the Sonic Maximizer by BBE, although it sounds like a limiter, it's not, it's more of um, a harmonic um, exciter um, which helps to bring different, um, different frequencies um, that you otherwise don't have in your mix um, and it just helps to polish and sheen things slightly. So yeah, here we have um, here we have the Sonic Maximizer sat here in Cubase. So if we take a listen to where we're at now on the track. Okay, I'm gonna mute the lead now. Okay, so I tend to just give it a small push, maybe one, one and a half decibels on the um, on the low contour, which kind of takes care of the bass end of the track, um, and then the process kind of brings out the um, the brightness, you know. So yeah, you can really hear that comes out a lot there. So again, I'd. I use this very sparingly indeed, um, one or two decibels maximum boost I would use, you know. Um, and another thing that I've always done, um, just when I think I've got the levels right, I always back off slightly. Um, if I think the volume of the snare drum is just perfect where it is, I'll turn it down just ever so slightly because generally the way my brain's always worked is if it's louder it's nicer or if it's sharper it's better. and I think rather than choosing an extreme, I've always thought, right, just when I think it sounds perfect, I'll just back off a little bit and that's always worked for me, so that's what I've always done. And if we take a listen here, we should be able to hear the difference now with the BB on and with the BB on. Okay, and you can hear that really brings it to life, you know? So again, just as I said, just when I think I've got it right, I'll back off a little bit just to make sure I'm not overdoing it. Yeah, and generally when it comes to um, when it comes to my master channel, I never really put any sort of compressor or anything on the um, 
on the master bus because I kind of feel it damages it for somebody to master it at a later date. Um, because a lot of my music is released these days, I know that anything that I do on the master channel is undoable, basically. So I tend to leave that part for the professionals. Um, sometimes if I'm mocking up my own masters, um, there are various things I use. I use the Waves plugins, of course, the L1. Um, I also use the Avlon, um, the vacuum tube compressor. Um, gives us a really nice um, analog sound, you know, it induces quite a bit of um, top noise as well, but um, it really does sound great. Today I have the Avlon set up to two auxiliary sends on the deck, um, just um, aux one and two. Um, I have the left going into one and the right going into two, um, and I have that return back on another channel also. So let's have a listen and um, yeah, I'll just try and get um, a nice hot signal coming out of the Avlon. <laughs> Okay, so that's the signal that's running through the Avalon. Um, I've actually set up a small EQ curve already, so I'll just reset this and then you may be able to hear the difference. Okay, yeah, so you can definitely hear the bottom end brought out straight away there. Um, and I just tend to, basically we have here an eight band EQ or six band EQ even. Um, and I use the first two bands, the bass bands, and I boost them ever so slightly, um, leave all of the rest of them at zero, and if I feel I want to pick up on the BB slightly more, I can just touch the tops and you can hear it. But as you can see, it's ever such minute volume changes there. Um, and then the same with the compressor, I literally have the compressor working maybe one or two decibels reduction, just to kind of bite the claps and bite the punch on the, um, on the snare and things, but like, sounds really cool. Yeah, and so, um, I mean, again, this is a work in progress, so we'll take a look at the different parts in the studio later and we'll fix up all the different elements. Um, but yeah, I mean, when we tend to make a track, that's what we start with and that's kind of the, um, the basic bones and all the rest of it. It's just um, disco dust sprinkled on the top. 